Hi everyone, Steve here, and let's talk through The Thin Blue Line. This film was voted by um, Variety in 2008 as the most important political work of the last 20 years. And I think there's some truth to that. I mean, what you're seeing in this, this isn't just a film about a, a cop shooting. It's a film that's really about, um, well, the death penalty and the ethics around the death penalty and the ethics around a political system and a legal system that seems to be, um, you know, seems to have some sort of KPI on how many people um, they're sending to the death chair. And because of that, um, people are kind of pushed through the system without um, much um, sort of ethical um, guidance and um, ethical questioning. And, you know, often as a result, they're killed when, as this film will um, sort of unravel, um, often they are perhaps not guilty of the crime that they are being committed. Now, of course, this is Errol Morris's um, theory, and like a film like Catching the Freedmans, he's making a clear case for somebody charged with a crime, and he wants that crime to be questioned, and he really wants to campaign for uh, the exoneration of that person through the legal system. So the, the, the film needs to be understood as a reaction against sort of the realistic observational style, so the cinema verite style um, that often you're seeing with documentaries. At the time of the film, um, in 1988, this sort of the observational style was hugely, hugely successful due to a number of films sort of in the 1970s like Give Me Shelter and, um, of course, the Don't Look Back. And... Earl Morris wanted to do something different. He wanted to do something more cinematic with the documentary form, and that's very much what you see in this film, where you see a lot of um, it's it's more stagey. You see a lot of reenactments, reenactments actually on studio lot sound stages. Okay, so it's not like a documentary that we've come to know. It's a documentary documentary that really challenges the very idea of what a documentary is and what a documentary can do. Now, because of this, um, the film wasn't nominated for a Best Documentary in the, the, uh, in the Oscars in 1988 because the feeling was that the film was based on fiction and the film was a fictional film because it had reenactments, it had scripted content, and it actually had actors, not just social actors in the film. So think about this film when you're watching it and whether you actually agree that it is a documentary or it isn't a documentary and it's doing something else and have our have our, have um, our own understanding of the documentary changed um, that we would absolutely consider this to be a documentary film. Now with the, uh, the Bill Nichols modes, this um, I would say it actually incorporates uh, two modes, the reflexive conventions and the performative conventions. Um, it very much borrows techniques from the fiction film for an emotional subjective response. It wants to get an emotional response from you like a film, like, uh, say, Catching the Freedmans. It emphasizes the expressive nature of film, right? So it does have an anti-realistic technique going on in this film. Right, so the thing about many films is it's saying this is real because we're showing you it as it happened. We're showing you the actual footage of how it happened. Where this film doesn't have that, doesn't have any um, footage of the actual shooting, so it's recreating that. Right, so reenactments are hugely, hugely important to this film. It's um, very much performative, in that you've got the documentary maker directly interacting with the subjects through the interviews. You know, um, Earl Morris is very, very present there in the interviews and sort of shaping um, the, 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 the questions that they're being asked and sort of the leading questions that are being asked. You have a number of people, about five or six people, lying on camera in this film. It's quite incredible uh, for what it does with the social actors and the interviews and what's actually going on there. The film is constructed like an investigation, all right? And think about that, the way the film is constructed like an inve investigation um, and the audience is being addressed in a very emotional and direct way, all right? 
Uh, now, the subject matter often with a performative does concern identity, points of identity, and points of sexuality. That's not really covered in this film, and I'm quite interested in why, but um, I'll get to that in a couple of minutes. Now, here is just uh, a clip of the film, and what you can see, what, what really happens in this film, what's interesting about the film is the music, um, the non-diegetic music, as much as the diegetic music, the non-diegetic music being music that the, the characters actually can't hear. It's um, music sort of added on. And Philip Glass, the famous uh, Philip Glass, did the score for this film, which again is why many people consider it to be a work of fiction and not documentary, which again is really interesting. And here you've got two talking heads, the two lead um, sort of social actors, where they were both, um, they were together that day, and then one was accused of the crime, and another was sort of blaming him for the crime. So I think it's kind of interesting the way that it cuts the two together, and the contradictions that they're both saying together, the way that it's cutting to particular images um, across the film, as they speak, you know, there's a very cinematic thing going on in this film. You will notice when you're watching the film on the big screen just how strikingly beautiful the film actually looks. It's not like a documentary where many documentaries are extremely gritty in that realistic style. It's almost that kind of almost ugly style, um, you know, to get that realistic thing going on. Here, even the interviews, you can see, I mean, they're, they're staged in a particular way, just the framing of them um, and, you know, the juxtaposition of them where he's cutting one shot to another. These shots of the landscape, again, it, it reminds us of a film like, say, Capturing the Freedmans, where environment and location uh, becomes very important to the film. The mapping, actual maps that we see across the film also uh, extremely important in trying to place the characters but also trying to get a sense of the social context of this film and what's actually going on in this film and the fact that these two um, social actors were travelling through this environment and um, not so much being part of the environment. So the film is constantly, constantly cutting from what they're saying to shots of things like uh, locations. And also you get this whole idea of the forensic nature of the film. Here is a reenactment, and the film is continually giving you different reenactments um, from different perspectives. One character will say one, something, and then they'll reenact that, and then another character. And that works across the film. And the film is really interested centrally in these reenactments and what's actually going on in the reenactments. The first time you see the reenactments in the film, it, they're quite kind of disconcerting because you're not used to such stagey reenactments in a documentary. But as the film goes on, you become quite used to it and the reenactments actually become quite compelling as the film goes on. The reenactments, they're never the same reenactments. So think about the reenactments when you're watching them. And what's really interesting in this reenactment is the way of those close-ups, the, the shots, the shooting, the use of forensic um, illustrations to show particular things that are going on. Um, this is also part of the reenactment. And think about where we go from there. So we go to, say, the bullet head. So we're talking because the the policeman who died, the forensic shots to actually get a remote emotional response from you, you know, photos of him in uniform and also the way that the film is um, using the press and the uh, sort of forensic photographs to give you a sense of this person and to say this is actually, you know, this is an individual and we need to actually get the, to the bottom of this. We need to get to the truth of what actually went on um, in this uh, in this moment. Okay, so while marketing the film, Harvey Weinstein, uh, he was the head of Miramax, he declared, never has Miramax had a movie where a man's life hangs in the balance. So think about this film, think about the, the way that the film was being marketed, which I think is really interesting, that the, it was actually pushing. It wasn't just saying, this is a film to entertain. It was saying, there is a social duty by you all. And it's about ethical audience behavior as well. And people becoming really interested in 
what they're seeing on the screen and reacting against that. The film, like I said, is really trying to push against this whole idea of executions and the public ex executions. And Morris makes it very clear that he believes the wrong man was convicted for this crime. Um, now, it mimics... So what you actually have in this courtroom drama, and it is sort of a courtroom drama, is the way that it mimics the trial techniques, right? It has testimony from expert witnesses, from police, lawyers, judges. It tries to contradict all of this. It has a complexity and a contradiction of evidence, right? which is to destabilize the, the, the ability to decide on a verdict. And think about that, the way that you're given so much contradictory evidence, right, that you surely can't actually put this man to death. And that's what he's trying to do, right? So the obvious comparison is catching the Freedmans, where um, Andrew Jarecki was saying that Jesse Friedman was innocent of the crime and he should be exonerated. And what he's doing is throwing you all of these contradictions about all the evidence that they had and saying, well, you can't really base anything on this evidence. Firstly, because the a lot of the evidence is based on memory and can you actually put somebody away um, in jail for somebody only relying on their memory? And um, again, uh, I think both films are really trying to discredit the process of the legal system. Now, the social actor uh, becomes very important in this film. Um, so, Randall Adams was, he was in prison for 12 years uh, because of this crime. Now, unlike today, where I think you get 80,000 American dollars in America um, for every year you're put away incorrectly, uh, in 1988, there was no such thing. So when he was eventually released, um, he received no payment from Texas from this. He received no payment uh, for the film. Right Now, Randall Adams, so this is the guy who got out of jail because of the film, Right, he sued the filmmaker over the rights to his life. Now, the, 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 whole, the whole legal proceeding seemed a bit ridiculous because... Errol Morris wasn't trying to control the copyright of Randall ha Adams, right? But Errol Morris did want the rights to the film and he wanted the rights to any book and any publications that came out. And Randall a Adams felt that he had a, um, he deserved some cut of the film. Now, Mr. Adams and Errol Morris, they made an agreement, right, before the film started. And the, the agreement was this if the film is a documentary, right? Uh, Randall Adams would receive ten dollars, right? If the film was a fiction film, right, he was going to receive sixty thousand dollars and two percent of the profits he made, right? Now, Mr. Adams' lawyer, right, he said, "Well, the film is a commercial film and it's a work of fiction because of the reenactments, right, and because the film was released in, um, the you know, commercial theaters." Now. They were very different in this sort of era of the documentary where many documentaries do play in the cinema. But at the time, it was very, very unique for a film to be playing at the, um, at the cinema. So it's certainly a film that wasn't a theatrical I'm sorry, not theatrical film, a musical film. So often, you know, films like Give Me Shelter would play in the cinema, but they were really films about particular bands and particular celebrities and things like that. At the time, this was kind of rare. But think about that. Think about the social actor. Um, think about whether there is a fair claim to be made that this is not a documentary, is a work of fiction, and therefore uh, Randall Adams deserves 2% of the profits. Now, Errol Morris, of course, said that he was $100,000 in debt because of the film, and the whole idea to actually be paid $60,000 for a social actor is completely, completely ridiculous. Um, I suppose for Randall Adams, being let out of jail, he had no money, he'd been in jail for 12 years, he was trying to get some money from somewhere, I suppose. Um, but have a think about that. Have a think about, say, an actor like, um, you know, the teacher from to Have It To Hold, where he also tried to sue um, the filmmaker as a social actor. And it always becomes this problem of, do you pay a social actor? And if you pay a social actor, I mean, the problem is ethics, because if, if, if you pay someone $100,000, you're kind of owning them in a way. You're kind of saying, you're sort of saying, well, I'll give you $1,000 if you say to camera what I'm asking you to say. You know what I'm saying? If you don't pay them anything, then 
you know, they have no obligation to to you and they can pretty much say whatever they want. So think about that. Think about the social actors and why they wouldn't be paid more than um, why they would be. Now, there is something um, about sexuality in the documentary films and the uncomfortable place of sexuality in documentary films. I want you to read a Zoic um, Drurix um, piece, which is a really wonderful piece, which appeared in Screen, the journal Screen, saying the courtroom and the closet in the thin blue line and capturing the Freedmans, which is the title of the piece. It's a great piece of writing. And um, Zoe really questions the whole idea about um, sexuality in both uh, the thin blue line and capturing the Freedmans and what's going on with the way that sexuality is being used. Now, with the thin blue line, the film is discreet about the sexual relationship between uh, these two men. These two men, they met um, that afternoon and they were hanging out together. They met on the side of the road and it's never mentioned in the film. They met on the side of the road as a, you know, as a form of kind of cruising. You know, one man was picking up another man. Not one testimony suggests this, right? That the two, you know, the cars were parked on the side of the road for sexual activity, that that's how they met. Now, the question that the... The, um, the chapter is asking, and the question I'm asking is, if, if the film sort of declared more explicitly that Randall Adams was a homosexual, would this make him seem more guilty or more suspect? And Zoe um, Durick's piece is saying that documentary has this really awkward and weird relationship with homosexuality and gayness, where it's almost like if somebody is gay, then they're therefore they're guilty of particular things. And she uses catch, the capturing the Freedmans as a, a particular way of framing this also, especially the, the latter part of capturing the Freedmans, where you have, you know, David, who's a clown and he's working with children and, um, you know, another brother is gay, almost to say that there were really peculiar things going on in the house. And this is why there's... Um, you know, this whole idea of, you know, one character being gay and another character working with kids, which doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, it's it's so muddled and it just seems so weird. And this is what the uh, the the, uh, the chapter is arguing, that it, it's almost like the, these directors don't know how to actually deal with queerness in any, um, any serious way. So they kind of suggest it without suggesting it and skim over it but kind of foreground it without foregrounding at all. And it's all just very muddled. And um, I think there's something going on with sexuality, um, homosexuality, certainly in this film, that the film and the filmmakers don't really want to engage with. And that is, again, something else to think about. Okay, so just a final thought. The film is really about the death penalty. I mean, we can look at it as a film about a cop killing, but it's really about the death penalty and putting somebody on trial for the death penalty. And I think there's a whole bunch of really interesting questions that are being asked about that. Uh, the culpability of a state to execute a man because they could try him as an adult. And this is what the whole film is about. They didn't try the person who was 16 because they couldn't try him as an adult, but if they tried the adult, they could actually put him on death row. And really, do they have the evidence against that person? Um, the lack of closure makes this film so compelling, and I think that's what's so great about the film, that you don't have this categorical answer at the end of the film. Um, just finally, at the start of the course, we were asking how... Um, sort of for a definition of documentary. And I want you to think about this film and how it conforms to this initial um, definition of do documentary or whether it pushes against it and actually contradicts it. When we were talking at the start of the course, we said, well, doc documentaries are kind of defined as being non-fiction. Is this film non-fiction when you have so many strong reenactments and things like that? It was about the real historical, political and cultural events of the world. It was unstaged. Well, obviously, this film isn't completely unstaged. There's a lot of stage in this, you know, things being re reenactment and restaged. And it's actually, you're on a soundstage doing it. Um, it was based on observation rather than intervention by the documentary maker. Well, again, that's not true. The documentary maker is very much intervening here. And the documentaries were informative and educational. Um, so think about that. Think about what we're talking about in kind of, you know, week one. And think about how that's changed and that this film really pushes against that and really contradicts that. 
And not only was it doing it in discourse, Thimbley Line has always done that. And it's always been about that. It's always been about challenging this whole idea of what a documentary is, what a documentary does. And think about that, what a documentary actually does. Okay, um, I'll leave it there. Thin Blue Line, it's an absolutely uh, superb piece of filmmaking. It considered one of the great documentaries ever made and also one of the great movies, period, ever made. See, it, see you there. Uh, looking forward to it.